Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. No need for a sigh this week because Tottenham were half decent. More than half decent, I'd say. And back-to-back uh, -back victories, you know, things looking a little bit more positive than they were. Plenty to delve into. Um, good moments, bad moments. Uh, but on the whole, more positives this week. And, and that makes it a much more fun video anyway for me to do maybe not for you guys maybe you like to hear me kind of whinge and rant and moan about stuff but uh no some good stuff to kind of talk about and uh some little chats i had with uh, nuno with oliver skip this week as well to to talk about so uh and little things i saw at the stadium on uh sunday as well so lots to dig into um but let's start right from the beginning obviously the match itself, so much better. So much better. It was a win that ticked a fair few boxes, I think. I think I maybe hopefully said this at the end of the last video, that, look, what they had to do against Villa, that was the biggie. Enes Mura, yes, it had its kind of merits to it. Um, but this Villa match was very much about making a, a performance out of it. Not only the result, the result had to be good, I think, but also the fans inside that stadium, it was 53,000 or so of them in the end, had to be entertained. And they were, I think they were. I can't speak for all of them, but certainly I enjoyed it. I was there and, and I felt, you know, Spurs could have could have won by a lot more, to be honest. Um, you know, I think about it and what do we have? Son had chances, Kane had chances, La Celso had a couple of chances, Ondombele fashioned himself a really good chance, Emerson had a chance that probably should have done, I say should have done better with, he was un unfortunate, I think, it was, I think it was Mings blocked it in front of goal, so you know, Spurs could have won that game by a lot more. Had Harry Kane been a bit more of the Harry Kane that we know and love, rather than the Harry Kane that's still slightly feeling his way, um, I think Spurs probably would have won that, maybe 5-6-1. Uh, I think that would have been a lot higher scoreline. Uh, and that's that's what we've been calling for. We've been calling for the attacking, what was it, Daniel Levy promised us all. Um, Free-flowing, attacking, entertaining football. I think it was something like that. Uh, and, and we got it. We got it. We did. Um, and even the defence, I thought, was really good on the day. Obviously, it had its one block to the copybook, but which we're going to talk about. But I felt as a performance... And, you know, whereas people could rightly say against Mura, you know, they weren't a very high-level team at all. A lot of, There wasn't a lot of quality in what they did. And, and, you know, champions of Slovenia, of course, but in terms of, you know, being on uh, where they are in levels with Tottenham, it, it, it wasn't that kind of match. Um, but Aston Villa, much bigger test, really was. Villa have been excellent recently. They um, beat Man U, obviously, in their last Premier League game. They beat Everton. They're, um, you know, Dean Smith has gotten them playing some really kind of good football. They've negated the fact of Jack Grealish leaving and everything. And they were chanting at one point, the Villa fans, about, you know, Harry Kane, you should have bleeped off with um, Jack Grealish, which is a funny chant. It was a strange one. I kind of, I, I like the fact, I guess, that it was kind of looking at themselves as well, I suppose. But uh, obviously, ultimately, they lost the game. But what was really strange, I'm going to get into a little bit more when I talk about defence, but for a, I say that Villa been playing really good football, but actually on Sunday, Spurs resorted them to really having the sole threat of Matt Cash's long throws. And that was it. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit about those in, in a moment. But uh, I just want to also point out about the Mura game. And uh, a fair few people kind of maybe took this in a different way on the night. I think that last half hour was crucial against Mura for not only that match, but also for this Aston Villa match. And I think a lot of people in the day were like a bit sneery, a little bit like, oh, you've had you've needed Kane, Lucas and Son to rescue your job kind of thing. Um, as I've said, I think on the podcast and I wrote at the time, it's like Spurs weren't going to lose that game. They weren't. There was a little bit of a momentum shift, a slight one in that, yes, Mura were maybe getting ever so slightly close to Spurs' box, but the goal they had was a terrific goal Mura scored, um, but it was very much in isolation. It was very much their one real shot at goal. Um, they didn't look like they were getting it. If anything, Spurs just lost a little bit of impetus going forward. That was where the deficiency was. And bringing on your three subs, it just so happens those three subs are your three kind of main attacking threats, probably, and they all came on and they were fantastic. And I just felt that that half hour really fed into Sunday. It fed into 
made the confidence, especially for Son. Son, you know, we're going to come to Son in a little moment because I want to talk about Dean Smith's comments after the game. But, you know, it just gave them that extra kind of impetus. And I feel the crowd as well were expecting that little bit more. Uh, and the players, just, just like a jolt to them, just to remind them that they are really, there's a lot of quality in that Tottenham team. And it was very much a case of, you know, there's an expression, don't believe your own hype. There's also an expression, don't believe how bad people say you are. I think that's not an expression, but I'm making it an expression. Um, and I think that's the case. I think they just kind of needed to be reminded how good players they can be. Um, and I think that last half hour just showed them that again. And I, I think they took that into the Villa game. Yeah, yeah there was some little kind of flat moments. Um, the very not the very start, maybe between about five and 15 minutes or so in the first half. And then there was a little period, um, which I think when it was, I think it was just before the Villa goal maybe, when um, it was a little bit flat. But just ultimately, like I say, Spurs were creating. They were doing a lot, a lot of good things. It's almost a Silla Black impression there, but I'm not going to do that. Um yeah, much better. Much, much, much better. Um, and yeah, let's talk about Dean Smith's comments. I mean, he said after the game in his press conference, and I think he said it to pretty much every media outlet that would that interviewed him, um, he said the only difference between Spurs and Villa on the day was Son Jung Min, which Son was superb. Don't get me wrong. I am absolutely not saying Son wasn't superb. I'm going to talk about him at length in a moment because I thought he was fantastic. But I thought to say he was the only difference between the two teams, I felt was very generous to his Villa players and unfair, I think, to a fair few of the Spurs players because there were some really good performances uh, that Spurs put in. They really did. And like I say, you know, Kane puts away a few of his chances and some of those didn't come from Son. Um, and Lo Celso, you know, that great chance at the end he had. On the belly, the chance he made all of his own. You know, I just I, I I get why he said it because he wants to maybe take a little bit of the uh, attention off of the fact that, like I say, Villa only threat was those long throws. You know, we'll talk about the goal on their goal and how it came about, but that was a bit of a an aberration in the match. It wasn't something that was happening frequently at all in the game. Uh, Hugo Lloris had so little to do in the game, and I just felt it was one of those comments which, yeah, it was great praise for Son and fully deserved for Son. It just didn't really fit the match for me. Um, apologies if you're getting lots of weird light changes. It's because there's sun coming in my window, which is going up and then going down something, which is making me look like there's probably a nuclear explosion every so often going off on my right. Um, but yeah, um, Son was brilliant. <laughs> he was fantastic. I love seeing Son like that. When Son, don't get me wrong, Son, you know, his consistency is way, way, way better than it used to be. And he contributes a lot across the season, whereas maybe he had fits and starts earlier in his Tottenham career. But I just feel like that Son that we saw on Sunday is the Son that is one of the best Premier League players by a mile. Um, and, you know, and I think I said this before, it's either in one of my videos or it was with Guesty on the podcast, that I do genuinely believe that there's a case to be made for Kane needing Son more than Son needing Kane. And I think Sunday was what a perfect example of that. You know what I said before, you, you've probably heard me say it, whereas that's the one thing I want Kane to do more of um, at the moment. It's it's not the full Kane we're getting just yet, but I, I want Kane to be able to take a game by the scruff of the neck and absolutely own it. And that's what Son did on Sunday. And I just thought he was he was superb. I mean, I just thinking back to the run with Hoybier to set up Hoybier's goal. Um, there were numerous runs we did there. He should have had a couple of goals, to be honest. His actual, the only thing that let him down on the day really was his finishing. He, he sent a few way over the crossbar. I think he ran through and the keeper said, this is the thing about, again about Dean Smith's comments, is that Martinez was probably Villa's man of the match. And I think that says everything um, about their performance. And, and that's not just about Son at all. Um, and the bit that I just loved, I mean, obviously he, he also set up the second goal for Spurs, which was, quickly realised to be an own goal, which is a shame for Son because, I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you don't get an assist for an own goal, when that clear... I don't understand who decided somewhere that that's a rule that should be brought in or a stat that should be done because I don't understand how the assist... If anything, it's even more of an assist for the second goal than it is for Hoybiers. Both should have been assists. I, I don't get it, but... I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sitting in a panel telling the Premier League what to do. 
But yeah, the bit that I actually love the most, probably more than the goals, which is weird, uh, was the bit at the end when he kind of Spurs had a corner and they were trying to waste time. But then Son kind of found himself like, well, hello, I can run pretty much all the way to goal here from the corner flag. And he ran all the way up, but then he realised he was just starting to get surrounded by people and the keeper was right there. And I think he thought, do you know what? It's probably better for me that rather to try and have a shot at goal and potentially lose the ball, let them break up the pitch, I'm just going to take it back again. And he just dribbled it all the way back again to the corner flag. And it was awesome. It was like... uh, it was like playing, like when you play FIFA or something and you're just being a bit of a an arse to the other player and you're just dribbling around, dribbling around, dribbling around, dribbling around them, making them look daft. And that was kind of what Son was doing. It was so good. Um, and I think he eventually got fouled. So Spurs then won a free kick to eat up time. And he was superb. He was brilliant on the day. And, and you, you know, you get more of that Son. If that Son is here and ready and raring to go, Spurs won't have any issues. I had someone, I did a Q&A the other day, and someone asked me quite, you know, genuinely, are Spurs going to get relegated this season? And it's like, I'm sorry, but they had lost three games. And the quality in that squad, it just dictates that that shouldn't, shouldn't, this is where you know, everyone remembers these words when Spurs go on an absolute horror show of a run, but they shouldn't ever Ever those players would have to be absolutely disgraceful for an entire season for Spurs to go down. Oh, massively tempting fate there. I'm, I'm sorry, um, but yeah, Son was superb, absolutely brilliant. Um, and like I say, for Villa, it was all about that Matt Cash long throw. Which before the game, I was watching Hugo Lloris warm up, and he was um, they were putting him through this drill with Pierre Luigi Gallini on one side. Brandon Austin on the other, and they were both firing really deep long balls, roughly where Cash would take his throws from. And uh, Rui Barbosa, the goalkeeping coach, was like kind of slamming into him, jostling with him, harassing him, Loris. And so Loris had to try and catch it and punch it away under that pressure. Um, and it clearly was a, you know, going through the motions to try and get him ready for what would happen with Cash. But what actually happened on the day was that. Loris probably didn't have to make too many of those interventions. In fact, his defence did so well against that, which it's a horrible thing to defend against. It's so different to a corner or a free kick because it's like a flat ball. It just kind of comes in at this weird angle. Um, and if you're the attacking team, you're absolutely ready for it. You know, they were trained to what to do with it. Um, but Spurs, you know, Romero, Dyer, um, Emerson a few times. I remember Kane and Lucas also making headers away. I think possibly Hoybier as well. They really, really dealt with it well. Um, they, you know, and this, the whole defence were kind of on point. There's one moment they weren't, but I'm going to explain why. That I think that was a bit of an aberration. But you know, we we the players. Well, I say the players let. I was going to say the players let Nuno Espirito Santo take the blame for the Arsenal defeat and say it was his game plan and picking the wrong players and all that. I'd say they let him. I'd say Eric Dyer came out and pretty much said, he did an interview I saw after this game that where he was pretty much saying, no, there's nothing to do with the Spirit Centre. That was all us. That was all on the players. We just didn't do what we were asked to do properly. Um, which, was, which is what I really want Sp- uh, any player, just players to say more. Because I do feel that managers take the can a lot for stuff. And then end up getting canned. Um, but yeah, the game. So we've got to really give Espirito Santo, I think, praise for Sunday because his game plan worked to a treat. It really did. Look, defensively, Spurs were so solid. Um, and at the other end of the pitch, like I say, the movement was terrific. They could have created. They created so many chances. I think it was something like seventeen. Was it seventeen shots on goal? You know, all these stats about the chances created, XG, all that sort of stuff is all. All will have now risen because of that match. And and hopefully, with the games to come, they'll continue to do that. Um, but going back to the defence, you know, Romero and Dyer were excellent together. That one moment aside. Um, Romero and Dyer were the partnership of choice against um, Chelsea. Which, weirdly, I th- probably would have said this in my video afterwards. Despite the scoreline... Romero and Dyer were two of the better players on the day. They were just kind of let down by people around them making mistakes. Whereas actually the two of them, and I think Loris on the day, were pretty decent. And I don't know whether Espirito Santo remembered that. Um, you know, you might argue you maybe should have remembered that for the Arsenal game. But I do wonder with Romero's knee. I do wonder, which I'm going to speak about in about a minute or two. 
um, whether that was a, a part of it. But Romero was was excellent. This was the game for me where we really got to see him look more settled in the back line and looked like the Serie A defender of the year. We've seen glimpses, uh, but this one, across the whole performance, barring one lunge, one lunge of a tackle, I thought we got to see the big... You know, I, I called him a game-changer when he signed, and I think we saw how that is going to be, that what he's going to be like. And do you know what? I see, it's very early days, but I see that he's kind of got a blend of Toby Alderweireld. He's got the long crossfield balls that he plays, about four or five, and Spurs did a little compilation of them. They were superb. Absolutely hit his man every time, which Alderweireld didn't. And that was what Poch, I think, used to get really wound up about those Alderweireld crossfield balls, was that they would some just kind of go astray and they would bypass the midfield at the wrong times. But I kind of felt that Romero's were were really accurate. And uh, I think he's also got a bit of Jan Vertonghen because he loves to stride out of the defence. He loves to take the ball up the pitch. He can dribble with it. He's very confident on the ball. Um, he will stay up there sometimes, which is a little bit worrying, but Hoybier slots back into the role. Um, but I just thought you had that blend. You got an aggression that maybe those two players didn't have. He's got that. I don't know whether it's a South American thing because Davinson Sanchez has got a bit of it as well. But Romero, there's this real kind of... I think maybe it comes from the back three he used to play for Atalanta where he they all used to man-mark players often in that uh, tactic. And I think you see that with him and that if you dally on the ball one second more than you should, he goes bang and he slams in to get the ball. Um, and he does it a lot. And it's it's it worked apart from one moment, um, which wasn't really the same kind of vein. It was... Um, the bit I'm talking about is the goal. It's the Aston Villa goal. Um, what happened was, I cannot remember who the player was. Was it Bailey? I can't remember who it was. But he he just came out, mistimed it slightly, well, slightly, a lot, and slammed into the player. And then what happened was, Villa were given the advantage, and he left a big old gaping hole behind him, which Eric Dyer then had to come across. And with coming across, left room for um, Ollie Watkins to get him behind him. Um, so Dyer got quite a bit of flack for that, which wasn't really fair. It wasn't really Dyer's fault. Dyer was coming across to cover the big space that was left. And in doing so, perhaps Regulon maybe should have got a bit tighter behind him. Um, and that was how Watkins had the space behind. But really, it's Romero's fault in the, in the beginning um, because of the, the lunge that he made. But I just thought it was a shame because Dyer was really, really good. Dyer made a lot of excellent blocks, interceptions, headers. Uh, like Romero, I mean Romero made the interception that ultimately culminated in Spurs' first goal. The two of them, I think you might be seeing the partnership that maybe they're going to go with. I I like the idea of a Roden Romero partnership in the future, but I do feel that with Dyer being able to play on that left hand side, which Roden can do, but obviously Sanchez, it's not as comfortable when Sanchez or or Romero has to play on that left hand side of the back two, of the the central two. Um, but Dyer Romero, that looks like something that could, could build. Um, it does. And, you know, I know Dyer, Eric Dyer doesn't have a lot of fans or, or certainly has his detractors among the Spurs fan base, but I'd maybe get used to that one. I think that might be the pairing that we're going to see more of. And to be honest, they play like they did for 99.9% .9 of Sunday's game. They'll be a superb partnership. Like I say, don't underestimate the game-changing ability of Romero to that back line. You know, you could say, I, I don't follow them enough to say this with exact confidence, but I'd imagine that Van Dijk at Liverpool came in and upped the performances of those around him. Um, and we've seen that happen with Spurs. I, I kind of always felt that about Jan Vertonghen, that when Jan Vertonghen was in the back line in his prime, he upped those around him as well. Um, and I kind of feel Romero's going to do that. I think that's what we're seeing. I think Dyer looks more comfortable uh, I think Dyer tries to cover for people too much. Maybe Sanchez, when he goes wandering a bit or does something wrong, I think Dyer comes across and then it makes him look like it was his mistake. Exactly what we saw with Romero and the uh, the Watkins goal. And I think maybe if Dyer is just purely concentrating on his performance, then maybe we'll see less mistakes. Maybe. Maybe. But um, the thing with Romero, I just, just noticed he limps sometimes after challenges. So that knee... Gallini, uh, we did an interview with him uh, a week or two back and he kind of indicated that he's still feeling that knee problem he picked up in the Copa America final, Romero. So 
you know, wouldn't the best thing now just be to just say, look, take two weeks of rest. Don't go with Argentina. Rest up that knee and just try and fix that little niggling problem that it's got right now. But I get it. He wants to play with Argentina. He wants to play with Lionel Messi. And I get it. But I don't know when he's going to get a rest because the game's just come so thick and fast. There's so many internationals. There's so many you know, matches. Just Spurs are going to have to try and do without him in cup matches, I guess, and Europe as well. Um, but yeah, he's going to be excellent. And another player I thought played really well at the back was Emerson, Emerson Royal. He was probably the most solid I've seen him look so far in his games. A lot of really good defending, a lot of good headers, interceptions. He was strong, got battered a fair bit, took his wax, complained a little bit, spent a little bit of time on the floor, but he, you know, he just got up and got on with it afterwards. And he was, he was pretty strong at the back and, uh, Going forward, maybe, other than the shot he had at goal, maybe could have made some decisions a little bit better. Um, a little bit better decisions. Um, I asked Nuno about him afterwards, and I got another one of my Alistairs, which I'm now in four in a row, where he said my name in a slightly fatherly, paternal, oh, Alistair kind of way. Um, but... I thought it was a normal question. I asked him about the performance and, and reacting because that was an important thing as well for me was that, you know, he's made a big deal and quite rightly about the fact that Spurs have been reacting so badly to conceding goals. It's just like almost like they've been stabbed in the heart and they can't deal with it kind of thing. Whereas I felt on Sunday, you know, you saw the instant reaction, you saw Spurs march up the pitch and score, get back in the lead what within a minute or two. Um, so I'd asked him about that. But then I asked him about Emerson. I said, look, there were a lot of good performances across the team, and I know you don't like to individualise, uh, but did that performance show that Emerson is just, you know, he's settling in. He's starting to settle in at Spurs as well. It was quite quick as well it, it, for a player who's, you know, come from very different leagues and country and all that. Um, and he was just like, oh, we've got to be patient. But then went on to praise Emerson quite a bit. He gave a really good answer and then explained kind of what I just said, that, he still needs to improve, though. He still needs to work on the attacking element to his game and making those right choices when he's in the opposition half. And uh, yeah, I don't really know why I got told off on that one. Not told off. When I say told off, people go, like, oh, my God, you're so sensitive. I, I really wasn't saying I got told off. Just uh, it's that quite... I, I think he does it in a kind of a good-natured way. I hope so, but I think he does. Um, it's kind of almost paternal thing. Um, of Alistair, silly boy. Um, but yeah, no, I thought Emerson played well. Um, he did, and it was quite a kind of a promising one as well because some people, you know, we were kind of led to believe that he was more about the attacking and defending, and then some people quite rightly pointed out, looking at his stats and the things he did with um, in La Liga, that actually his defending was probably more what his game was about than the attacking, and it was the attacking that he had to improve on. I think that's what I saw on Sunday. Um, so no, he was really good. And then the man that I think makes a big difference, Mr. Oliver Skip. Um, I don't want to go on too much about Oliver Skip because it does seem like... A, I said this on the podcast with Guesty uh, yesterday. I, said, I think I'm going to have to start producing laminated membership cards for the Oliver Skip Club as well. It will meet on different nights to the um, Tongi Ondimbele one. Tongi wasn't too great yesterday. It's some nice moments, but he wasn't really at his best. Um, so yesterday, on Sunday... Um, but Skippy, I just, for me, I still can't really get my head around him coming out of the team for the Chelsea and the Arsenal games, because I think you saw how much they needed him. Um, he provides that shield in front of the, the back four. He unlocks Hoybier to do what Hoybier does. The Hoybier we saw at the Euros, that's what we see when Skip plays. The ability to get up the pitch, and Hoybier's finish was glorious. It would have been something that Kane would have been proud of. I just think Skip's so intelligent in his kind of where he, his positions he takes up on the pitch, his reading of the game, the interceptions he makes, the challenges he puts in. He's got another ridiculous yellow card. Um, I can't remember who got a yellow card against a couple of weeks back. It was so daft. It was unfair. And Sunday's one, which came from his own mistake. He did make a, a silly header back, which was too weak, and Ings got onto it. But then he came back and he won the ball, got to the ball, Yellow card. I, I, I don't get it. It shouldn't have been a foul, let alone a yellow card. But, you know, I said this again on the podcast with Guesty that 
and I don't really don't want to sound patronising. I'm just trying to understand maybe where this comes from. Where I'm still seeing on social media how no, how ordinary Skip is, and how he's no better than a Tom Carroll and a Harry Winks type. This is what is always said to me on social media, and I was just trying to get to the bottom of that. And I think. And again, this isn't meant to be patronising. It's very much meant to be a trying to understand maybe the different views and why we see things. I do wonder whether, because what Skip does is very much a... Um, it's not one for the highlights reel. It's not the stuff you're going to see on Match of the Day. You know, Maybe they're the kind of players that once in a while one of the pundits might pick out and do a little bit on. And then after they've done that, everyone goes, oh yeah, I like him. Because what he does is the dirty work. It's the it's the interceptions, it's the covering the space, it's covering where other players maybe should be. It's just acting as that screen. And I just wondered whether, well, if you're at the stadium and you're not purely only concentrating on the kind of box view you get on TV, maybe you're seeing the wider game, you're seeing what Skip is doing off the ball, you're seeing the positions he takes up when the, say, when Spurs are attacking. You see him coming across to cover other players. Whereas maybe, because I, I don't know, everyone, every like journalists, they're all saying, you know, how good Skip is and how good he's been and what a player is kind of developing into, the ones in the ground. And fans I speak to, like when I'm walking to or from the ground, they always kind of raving about Skip as well. And I just wonder whether those people that are saying that on social media about him just really being nothing particularly special... I just wonder whether, and it could be wrong, but I wonder, I could be wrong, I wonder whether they're watching it on telly. And I wonder whether you're just not seeing the whole picture of his performance. Because for me, and I've got no problem saying this at all, that I think he could be the best talent to come out of Spurs Academy in terms of that's gone on to make it since Harry Kane. I do think that. I think obviously we've seen a lot of incredibly talented, gifted attacking players and the like come out of the academy. Um, and obviously you've got Jaffet Tanganga as a defender, but I think Skip is kind of he's got a, a he's a bit of the whole package, and I think he could be. You know, I think we're looking at an England international to come, and you know, Jose said it himself: a future England, uh, sorry, a future Tottenham captain, maybe England captain, but certainly a future Tottenham captain. Um, I just think he's a superb player. And that was we got a little mini press conference with him after the Mura game. Um, we kind of didn't expect it. Suddenly he looked. Um, just kind of heard his voice somewhere, and I realised that he'd come on after the Nuno had come on, and he was sat there taking questions. So I quickly threw in one at him and just said, essentially, what's Nuno taught you? And what I got back was his whole press conference that I heard was a really detailed, interesting press conference. You know, sometimes you get young players, and I've had to interview a fair few of them, you just get, yeah, I'm definitely. And then all you get like five words, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I just, it's, I've got to do my job for the team, this sort of stuff. Skippy had a really interesting press conference. Every answer was really thought out, articulate, really interesting stuff. And then I asked him, yeah, what's Nuno taught him? And he just went into all these specifics about, he said, well, the best thing about Nuno, and this is what Jaffet told me as well, is that he's really concise in what he tells you. He doesn't waste time, doesn't, doesn't waffle, which you're probably thinking that's exactly what you're doing, but he doesn't go around the subject to it. He just tells you exactly, this is what I want you to do. This is how I believe you can improve this is going to work kind of thing. And that's what he wants. And Skippy said, what he's taught me is about um, keeping central when Spurs, so that when Spurs lose the ball, I'm there as the shield. Um, and yeah, it, it, there was more than that. Have, have a little look. I put I put something up on the website about it. it it's, uh, yeah, it was just a really, it could have just had a stock answer of, you know, that young players might say of like, Oh, yeah, I've learned lots from him and stuff like that, but not really specifics. And he went into more specifics and he spoke about the trust that he's given him. Um, and I think we're seeing out there, you know, it's so easy to forget. He's just turned 21, Skippy, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that Norwich loan is so huge for him. It really was so huge for him. And, um, yeah, I just think Spurs look better when he's in the team. I think he shields the defence. I don't think it's any coincidence that with Skippy back in the team, they looked more like the defence that didn't concede any goals in the first three matches. Um, you know, you could say rightly that he played against Palace, but I just felt the Palace game was just an absolute horror show as it was. He wasn't terrific that day, but then behind him you had Eric Dyer, a senior figure, kind of getting injured. You ended up with a red card. You ended up with a um, penalty. There were so many things going wrong 
that I think this young player in the middle, it was almost like he was just going to be one of those players that was going to struggle as well. But I feel like the first three, you could kind of see what he did. And like I say, for Hoybier, I think he's vital. I know some people might be worried about playing two players in the pivot that you know you haven't got one who's an Ondimbele, maybe, uh, or Moussa Dimbele, if we're going to go back, and, and him playing alongside Dyer or Wanyama. But I just feel that we saw it um, on Sunday. I think the Hoybier can play both roles. He can. Um, and I think Skip brings that out of him. So, yeah, sorry. I didn't actually want to go on massively about Skip, but I just love talking about him. Honestly, I love watching him play. I love, I love seeing young players come through the club and doing it on the big stage and just, you know, and getting to where they need to be and where they deserve to be. I've said it before, but I've been very fortunate to see a lot of him over the years playing for the academy teams at different levels. And I just, um, that should always be the aim. You know, we should always want to see, you know, your own academy products go on to excel. And I think maybe somewhere along the line, whether it's because of, you know, the computer games we all play, and I include myself, the FIFAs, the football managers, there is this kind of thing of wanting to always have foreign sexy signings you know if his name was Oliver Scipinio maybe maybe he'd get a little bit more kind of excitement around him um which is strange isn't it I think with young attacking players there's more of a oh play him like Dane Scarlett you know Dane Scarlett is a very young very talented player who isn't quite ready yet to be starting Premier League games or anything like that he'll get there he really will but, you know, there's probably more excitement about someone like Dane Scarlett than there is about Oliver Skip, who I feel, for me, has the potential. You know, he was, like, one of the best players in the championship last year, despite being, you know, 19-20. I don't see any reason why he could be... Spo- if he continues as he is, he could be, at the end of this season, be spoken about among the group of young players, up for, like, young player of the year. Um, PFA Young Player of the Year. I'm not going to say he's going to win it because, you know, you obviously you've got the likes of Phil Foden and people like that. And, um, you know, there's a lot of very talented young attacking players who probably catch the eye more, like I say. But I think he would deserve to be mentioned in the group of young players that really have pushed on in the Premier League. And still early days, you know, we're seven games in the Premier League, of course. But I think there's a lot of talent there. I really do. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just think Nuno really regretted it. Especially after the Wolves' performance. Nuno, um, Skippy had to hold the line, essentially, against Wolves. Um, he was there with, was it Tongi? Was it Tongi and Lo Celso? I'm trying to remember what they... Oh, that was... No, it wasn't a 4 one I just remember he was pretty much the defensive pivot of the whole thing. There was no Hoybier in the first half. And I just thought he was so good that night that then to drop him or not, or not start him in the Arsenal game, I think Nuno knew afterwards. When he spoke about selecting the wrong players, I think he was talking about Skip. I really do. I'd love to maybe ask him one day, maybe when the cameras are off and just say, did you mean Oliver Skip that day? I can maybe ask him when the camera's on. He might answer. Probably won't, but I could try. Um, what else do I want to talk about? Harry Kane. You know, I've kind of touched on him already. He... Is getting better. It's definitely he's definitely more involved. Definitely looks a little bit fitter. Uh, late on, he was doing some runs and that back heel for Lacelso. Late on, that chance was glorious. Oh, that would have been such a goal. Son to Kane back heel Lacelso. He just kind of scuffed at Lacelso rather than really hitting through the ball. But yeah, Kane's getting there. Um, he's one of those where I kind of feel going away with England isn't the worst thing. Unless he gets injured, fingers crossed he doesn't. But I think for him to go away and just get more minutes, more action, uh, and more kind of trying to get shots on goal and score goals, really, I don't think does Spurs any harm whatsoever. Um, and most of just Sunday was for me was about Nuno and was he's got a lot of flack recently, a lot of criticism, and I think. Fairly so for those three matches, of course. Of course, they were horrific. They were terrible. The attacking intent was just was dreadful. Um, and they, I understand, it would have worried people a lot because it kind of it um, it gave a verification almost to a lot of the stuff that Spurs fans were worried about. You know, another Mourinho and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, they, they may point as well to the first three games and say that while there were wins, you know, 
there wasn't enough attacking intent and creativity. And I just felt Sunday was huge in that respect in terms of showing far more of that. Much, much, much more. And if you could do that against a team like Aston Villa, who have gone to the likes of United and won, and they've beaten Everton and, and stuff like that, they're a very, very good team. And, you know, <clears throat> Ollie Watkins was, you know, a potent striker last year. Danny Ings has been one of the most potent strikers in recent years as well. And both of them, the goal aside, which was kind of gifted a little bit to Watkins, they looked, they were just kind of rendered almost redundant on the day. They were. And so defensively to do your job, but the attacking side, you know, create whatever I said, 17 chances. Um, that was big for him. It was a it was a big one. It was nice to see after the game, he he comes out after he's done his press conference. We had, we had a little issue with the press conference at first. We had There was some sound problems. I had to ask him the first question a couple of times because we just couldn't hear him. He could hear us, but for some reason we weren't hearing him properly. Um, and once he'd done his press conference, he, he does the same thing always at home games. You see him wander out and he has like a backpack on his back. It's almost like a school kid kind of thing on a school trip. Um, and he carries a little paper bag. I presume it's like their food that they get to take away with them to eat. Maybe maybe because he's done all his talking, he wants to just sit on the coach and eat it. I don't know. But yeah, he goes and he walks around the kind of outskirts of the pitch and off to the team coach. And I must actually say, before I say this, that when he... Um, he did so many selfies with the fans for them all. They were asking him. They were there were a lot, a lot of people asking him for for selfies after um, after his first pre match interview and after his post match ones at the pitch as well, side of the pitch. Um, and he, you know, to be fair to him, and obviously understandably, you wouldn't anyway. You wouldn't say no, but he took so many. He was there for a long time. Always reminded me of, doesn't it, Tom Cruise when he does movie premieres in Leicester Square, stays there for like two and a half hours taking photos of the fans. And it was a bit like that with Nuno. Was, there's got to be a, clearly a touch of, please like me and give me time. Of course there is. I will continue to repeat that this was maybe the first glance we got to see of a Nuno Espirito Santo Tottenham, and it's going to take time. Um, but I thought, you know, some people might say it's a cynical PR thing, but to be fair to him, He's done it every home game. Um, this isn't a new thing. But yeah, sorry, back to the walk around the pitch. He was um, he was doing his normal walk, but Steve Hitchin was just ahead of him. Um, Steve Hitchin, technical performance director at Spurs, he was talking to someone on some kind of video call. At first I thought it was Paratici, but then um, Guesty who was sat next to me said, no, no, he was, he was definitely down there, Paratici, at one point. So he's not like, unless he'd left early. But it looked like like a family call or something. And then just suddenly Hitchin kind of turned to Nuno and was turning the phone and Nuno was like all of that and kind of doing a big old wave and a smile to the camera. And it just kind of, it took me back to the Man City game. I don't know if you remember me saying, but after the Man City win, Nuno walked around the, the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium pitch with his family. Just They all took photos, took selfies and, and just kind of drinking in the moment that he had. You know, beating the champions in his first ever match or competitive match as Spurs boss. And I just kind of watched him out there walking along with Hitch and he just looked contented again. He looked like a lot of the weight had been lifted off of him. You know, it's only, you know, one Premier League game after three bad ones. And of course, you know, the international break could do what the international break does. But I just thought it was nice to just see him not have the weight of the world on him. Because, you know, football must be... Uh, it, you know, I think he is on... So or he was on social media. I don't think he's posted anything for about three years on his Twitter account. But, you know, if he could see the things people say and people tagging him into stuff like, oh, there's one Twitter account that... I don't know whether it's a Korean one or... I think it might be a Korean one that I've noticed in the past, and they absolutely, some of the things they say about him are horrific. Absolutely. I've, I've blocked the account because it's just, it's so, it's, it's talking about his appearance, uh, talking about how disgusting he is. It's a horrible, horrible account. It's one of those that has zero or one followers that you see crop. They are purely created to troll and say horrible things. And, and that's one extreme. You know, there's obviously, there's a lot of people just talking about the football and saying, kind of things about how he's, you know, he shouldn't be Tottenham manager and things like that. And I just, you know, 
if anyone knows me by now, you'll know I'm not one of those per- people that calls for someone to lose their job. I don't like. I don't like saying this. I I will always try to kind of not give them benefit of the doubt, but try to see, understand what they're doing and why things are going wrong as well. Sometimes changes have to be made, um, but that's not for. I don't feel that's for me to call for. Um, I don't want anyone to lose their job. I don't like that whole mentality. And yes, I know in football, they're paid very well. Um, I saw, interestingly, this week, that reminds me, um, David Ornstein uh, did the piece saying about the uh, that Spurs have a, a clause in Nuno's contract that says that if he doesn't finish top six this year, he can go in the summer. They can let him go in the summer for no... Um, compensation or anything which personally I haven't heard that and the club very quickly have kind of come out and said that's not true at all and they're quite angry about it all um I, I should obviously stress that David Ornstein is a fantastic journalist he really is he, he's terrific um I don't you know I mean I think to be fair to him he's also balanced it out by saying you know a Spurs spokesman also said to him that there was no truth in this at all um, personally, it does sound like the kind of thing Spurs would put in a contract, um, especially someone that, you know, they may be taking a little bit more of a risk on uh, than the other managers that they were looking at. But I can only go on what I'm told, and, and I certainly I know that there's an option for Spurs to give him a third year. I know about that. I hadn't heard about this kind of, I suppose it's like a break clause, really, isn't it? I haven't heard that myself, and Spurs maintain that it doesn't exist. But you know, um, we shall, we shall. Well, hopefully, we won't have to see because Tottenham will do well and they will finish better than they did last season. But yeah, my point was, I don't like to see people struggle. I don't like to see, you know, Nuno's clear is a good guy, and I think he's got the best interests of Spurs in heart. At heart, he is not someone that is there to try and. You know, make himself look good. Um, and I, you know, I dealt with managers many, many years. I've covered not only the Premier League, I've covered um, lower football league, football league two stuff. I've covered non league, and I've had to speak to hundreds of managers. I've seen hundreds of managers come and go at various clubs, and you will get managers who are in it for themselves, who are in it to make themselves look good in after matches, who are there to absolve themselves of any blame of anything. And I just feel with Nuno, he's not one of those guys. He genuinely, there doesn't seem to be kind of an ego thing with him. He is very much trying to do what he thinks is best for Spurs and the players themselves. Um, Which, like I say, isn't something you see a lot in football. So yeah, I I want him to succeed. I'd love him to succeed. It would be great. Uh, Especially coming into a job with all the problems he came into at the start. Um, you know, so many things. I'm not listing them all again, but he had so many things to deal with when he first arrived, and then things that happened in the first international break. Um, and I just, I, I, yeah, I feel good for him. I did feel good for him. There's some people that I've already seen that you know they just want him to go regardless. I've seen people saying, "Oh, I saw some tweet, someone saying, oh, Villa beat Villa, Spurs didn't beat Villa.' So no, that's really not what happened. Um, but yeah. Yeah, let's see what happens. I mean, now we've got the international break, which, uh, you know, you just think, you know, Spurs had a terrific set, uh, terrific August, won every Premier League game, terrible September, started October with a win, and then bang, here comes the international break again. I mean, at least one thing they've got is that they sorted out the exemption rules. Um, so what happens now, if you're not aware, players that have been to red list countries on the international break can return... They must spend, I think it's 10 days, uh, they must remain within the club bubble. They can train, they can play matches, that's absolutely fine now. However, they have to remain within that club bubble. I don't even think they're allowed to go back to their family, which for Spurs is fine. They've got the lodge where they can stay, it's a luxury hotel, they can stay there for 10 days without any problems. Obviously it's tough on those players who, you know, have got family, I've got uh, David Sanchez obviously has got a wife and a young child, so that's still going to be tough. But I guess that's part of the game, and that's if you decide then to go and play for your country. Unfortunately, that's kind of what you have to deal with. Um, so there's that aspect to it. That should be slightly easier. However, then you just look at the fixtures, and I'm still intrigued to see how this plays out, because I was just looking at it before I did this. 
So Argentina, all, all of them got three matches. They've all got to cram in these matches. So Argentina got three matches, and the third match at home is against Peru, uh, Peru which is in the early hours of Friday morning in the UK next week. So obviously Spurs play on the Sunday at Newcastle. So that's, you know, what is that, 48 hours later kind of thing. Um, Brazil, so Argentina, obviously, that's the Celso Romero. Then you've got Brazil. Brazil, their third match is at home against Uruguay, which again is in the early hours of Friday morning in the UK. So Emerson Royale could play in that potentially. Again, another player who will arrive if they're coming home will fly back home literally the day before Spurs play um, and probably late on that day as well. And then you've got Davinson Sanchez playing for Colombia. The third match, again at home, against Ecuador. That's technically, I think it's 10 o'clock on Thursday night, UK time. And I don't understand this. Maybe there's a logistical reason for it and someone far more educated or understanding of South American international football can explain to me. Why are all these matches being played on the Thursday night for those teams? You know... I don't. I haven't looked at. It. I don't think the European game. I don't think the European games go past the Wednesday, unless I'm mistaken. Maybe they do. I'm trying. I'm not trying to remember what the nation league games when they are. But you know, on the whole, often European games are the Wednesday at the latest. So the players then have you know Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Thursday and Friday. Certainly, I just don't understand why they play on the Sunday in the South American games and then don't play until the Thursday night. It seems a big gap, and I don't understand it. Um, I mean, hopefully Spurs will try to do some deals um, in terms of the players maybe not featuring in the third match. I don't know. Uh, it's difficult because I think they're all qualifying games as well. So it's not like it's a friendly you can kind of just sack off. Um, yeah, International breaks, eh? Whew. I mean, he's not going to have many players to work with Spurs Santo back at home. Obviously, you've got the, the former England boys. You've got the Winks, Ali... Um, obviously a tough one for Ali who didn't even feature at all yesterday and a Sunday and watch Spurs play well you know it's he's going to have to work his way back into that team again it's going to be a tough job for him I think because I think Lo Celso probably when he came on showed that he's probably the one that will push on Dimbele. Um I think Ali I do wonder whether we're going to see him now become the cup and European starter um, obviously international break may change that so yeah so Nuno's got um, Ali, Dyer, Winks, uh, Galini didn't get called up for Italy, I don't think. Um, Brian Hill got a call up for Spain to uh, come into their team. I think he, uh, yeah, he's there with Reguilon. So that's great for Hill. That's one of the positives. That's a big thing for him. That will hugely push on his confidence. This is one of these things, it's strange, isn't it, where... You know, other people might say, oh, you've gone to Spurs from Barcelona, let's say, to Emerson Royale. Emerson Royale is now in the Brazil squad again, which he hadn't been in the last, um, certainly the last one he wasn't called up for. You know, he's got himself in there. Hill has gone to Spurs, played really well in some matches, and he's got himself into the Spain squad for the first time, which is fantastic. Um, but I'm trying to think who else is left. It's really not many people at all. Obviously, yeah, yeah Brandon Austin will be there. Uh, Skippy will be the under 21s. Lucas, Lucas will be back at home. He doesn't really get called up for Brazil anymore. Um, and then I'm struggling for anyone else. Joe Roden, I think, has got called up. Um, I'm not sure if Jaffe got called up for England under 21s or not. I don't think he did, maybe. Maybe that's one. Obviously, Ryan Session will be coming back from injury soon. Bergvine, I think, is on his way back as well it's not many. You, know, you have to flood that with under-23 players or you give them plenty of days off. Um, I mean, they're not going to get a full two weeks off, but yeah, it's going to be a funny bunch. You know, the last international break, I think he had a little bit more to work with, but not so much in this one. But yeah, please don't let it affect Tottenham this time. Please. Um, it was just such a momentum killer last time. And I think Nuno would have loved to probably just keep going with these players after that Villa performance. But instead, we have these two weeks of uh, international football, which uh, you know my thoughts on it. It's not up there with my favourite pastimes, let's put it that way. So there you go. Um, what I might do is a QA, and a um, maybe next week, obviously, as we don't have games to talk about. So as you know the drill, if you've watched these before, get your questions in below into the comments. 
Um, and I will do my best to kind of pick as many as I can to cram into, let's say, just under an hour or so next week. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, ask, ask, ask your questions about the club. Some people like to ask questions about kind of what I do in terms of my job and stuff, which, you know, if there's any young journalist out there, by all means, I can tell them kind of about the way I kind of got through the system. It took a long time. But I, you know, done a, a fair few kind of jobs in journalism and, and very different kind of jobs as well. So and I don't mind talking about that at all. Um, yeah, I mean, mainly just just about Spurs and the players and what we can expect. And if you kind of want to know any little things that maybe on the behind the scenes that you might not know about that I might know about, I'm quite happy to try my best to answer them. Um, yeah, I'm sure. Hopefully, many of you have seen the Q and A episodes before. I, I enjoy doing them; they're good fun. Sometimes people put some quite funny ones in there as well. I think, did I get one last time? Would you rather fight 100 Alistair Gold sized No, 100 duck sized Alistair Golds or one Alistair Gold sized duck? Which was a very different question, uh, which I, I enjoy a, the odd silly one like that. Not too many. We've got to talk about Spurs mainly, but the odd one does make me chuckle. Um, and I'll choose, yeah, I'll choose as many of the best questions as I can to, to rattle through them. But yeah, I'm going to head off now. Um, Enjoy as much as you can the international break. Um, but hey, it, positive things for Spurs. A little bit better. We can smile again. You know, we can't grumble too much after that. Um, and yeah, as always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye.